But we do, of course, have to talk about Texas A&M. And to be clear, like, let me let me make one thing abundantly clear, right? Like, I don't go into every week saying, I got to get a Texas A&M segment on this show. This is what I, I have to talk Texas A&M. No, there's a lot of good outlets that cover Texas A&M on a day-to-day basis. My buddy's at Texags. Um, but I only talk about Texas A&M because it's oftentimes in sports, right? If you're really good, you become interesting. And if you're really bad, you become interesting. Uh, kind of like in the NBA right now, right? Like the, the Los Angeles Lakers are probably the most interesting team, even though they stink. They're not the Warriors. They're not the Bucks. They're not the Celtics. But the Lakers are the most interesting team in the league. The Cowboys, when they're really bad, are very interesting. Tom Brady right now is not a very good quarterback. That is interesting. And so the college football perspective of Tom Brady throwing balls into the ground five feet in front of his receivers in Carolina on Sunday, well, the comparison in college football right now is the Texas A&M Aggies. Texas A&M went to South Carolina. Texas A&M played a team that they have historically dominated since they got to the SEC. Texas A&M lost again, third straight game. It's been close to a month now since they've won in an actual football game. Final score on this one, 30 to 24. A couple of thoughts on this one. You know, first of all, this was the game. Like what, I don't know if surprising with Texas A&M at this point isn't the right term, but this did feel like this was kind of the game that they were supposed to get right. Uh, they're coming off of a bye. Yes, they are dealing with a lot of injuries, including a lot of guys that did not play on Saturday night. But you're coming off of a bye. You're playing a South Carolina team that, like I said, you have dominated. You've played basically every year since you got to the SEC. You have never lost to them. And this is the one that you think, okay, you're off a bye. You'll be motivated. You'll be prepared. You're going to take care of business against South Carolina. Uh, no. Texas A&M gives, off a, gives up a kickoff return to start the game. Texas A&M falls down 17-0 uh, before anyone can even blink their eye. I think it was like six minutes into the game, they were down 17-0. And while they did rally, Texas A&M ultimately lost to South Carolina again, 30-24. to This now drops them to 3-4 and four overall. Their third straight loss, as I said, they have not won in over a month on the calendar. Uh, and oh, by the way, the last win that they had was against Arkansas in that game that hit where the ball hit the top of the goalpost. And, and it, they were like essentially like an inch or two away from being now on a four game losing streak, being two and five overall and just being really, really, really bad. And so obviously Texas A&M loses. And we all know what happens at this point in the calendar every time Texas A&M loses. It becomes a referendum on Jimbo Fisher. It becomes a referendum on the present and future of this program. Jimbo Fisher still owed north of 80 plus million dollars in a buyout. And so Saturday night became this fascinating question of what do you do? Same questions, right? What do you do? Would Jimbo Fisher even still have a job if the buyout wasn't so insane? And what is next for this program that is absolutely reeling right now. So I want to discuss all that, but I also want to discuss a new conversation that I do think is starting to emerge as this team continues to struggle week after week, after week, after week, after week. Now, in terms of what is going on and how it gets fixed in the context of everything, let's start with one thing. I know it doesn't make for sexy headlines or podcast radio conversations, Jimbo Fisher is not getting fired, okay? I know there are people in the media that are going to tell you, well, you know, the A&M boosters, they might come up with the money and $80 million is nothing. They are not paying $80 million to get rid of Jimbo Fisher, okay? They are not paying $80 million this offseason to get rid of Jimbo Fisher. He is going to be able to come back next season. I do think there are going to be staff changes. I do think certainly um, Jimbo Fisher is going to try to continue to sell fairly or not that Wait until these young guys start to get better and start to improve. We're building something. It is taking time. And so let's, let's just let, like, let's, you know, you can go to another podcast. If you want to talk about is Jimbo Fisher going to be fired and bought out this year, it is not happening. And I think he gets most of next year for sure to figure it out. Then we, you know, if, if they're sitting at three and four or two and five in the end of October of 2023, then that's a different conversation that we have to have. And so as we look at what is going on right now, what is happening, how can it be fixed, what can be fixed, there are two things kind of on a positive note that come to mind for me, really three. One, even though AM was coming off of a bye, they have a ton of injuries right now. That's not an excuse. 
I'm not saying it's okay to be three and four right now if you're being paid $9 million a year. But facts are facts, spades are spades, the truth is the truth. And they are down quite a few impact players, obviously even dating back three, four weeks ago. Their best wide receiver, Anaya Smith, is hurt. Injuries on the O-line, injuries on the defense. They were down to their third-string quarterback by the end of the night on Saturday. So there are a lot of injuries. Two, what I would say, and I'm not making excuses for Jimbo Fisher. I promise, promise, promise I am not making excuses for Jimbo Fisher. But I do think one thing that like cannot be ignored they're really, really, really close. Again, that sounds like an excuse. That sounds like somebody trying to defend somebody. And I understand when you have a $90 million contract and it is year five, that is not an excuse. At the same time, you go back two weeks to Bama. Listen, they were on the goal line, one play to beat Alabama for a second straight year. And you can sit here and say, well, Bama lost last week to Tennessee. Well, Tennessee's a really good team. Uh, Bama lost by a field goal. If Bill O'Brien knew how to call plays, they're at least going to overtime and they might survive. So don't tell me that, listen, I've been as critical of Bama as anybody. Let, let, let's not pretend like the like Rome is, you know, fallen in one day here. And AM had a chance to beat them. And what I would say about the South Carolina game is if you paid close enough attention, if you paid close enough attention, there were little bits of improvement across the board. One, Almost 400 yards of total offense. I'm not making an excuse. I'm just stating facts. Almost 400 yards of total offense. They had over 100 more yards of offense than South Carolina. They finally started to move the ball a little bit. And it wasn't enough. And they didn't win. But the offense did look just a little bit better. Not good enough. I get that. But a little bit better. And then on top of that, they also did give up the special teams touchdown. If they make a tackle on the opening drive, there is a scenario where they force a punt and they end up winning that game 24 to 23 instead of losing it 30 to 24 after giving up a special teams touchdown. So that's the reality. That's the truth. It's not excuses. But I also do think as we start to look at Texas A&M, I do think one thing becomes increasingly clear every single week. And I think this is the realistic fix that will happen at Texas A&M. Jimbo Fisher, the head coach, has to fire Jimbo Fisher, the play caller. And if Jimbo Fisher, the head coach, will not fire Jimbo Fisher, the play caller slash offensive coordinator, then the AD needs to come in and make sure it gets done. And I know what everybody will say. Oh, Jimbo Fisher's stubborn. Jimbo Fisher won't give up play calling. Well, let's back up a second. I've talked about this before on the show. Urban Meyer, several years ago, offense wasn't working. If you remember those JT Barrett years, somebody got in his ear and said, you got to change some things around here. It's not working. They brought in a guy named Ryan Day, and Ohio State has had the best offense in college football probably over the last five years, dating back to Ryan Day's one year as an offensive coordinator, his four years as a head coach. Jim Harbaugh was forced to bring in Josh Gaddis, change up the offense. It has been done. And if I'm Ross Bjork, the, eight, the Texas A&M athletic director, this is what I do. I sit down with Jimbo Fisher. It's not an emotional thing. It's the truth. Look at the stats. Texas A&M currently ranks 108th nationally in total offense, and that's after putting up 400 yards on Saturday night for, against South Carolina. They put up 400 yards, and they still rank 108th. That's 13 out of 14 SEC teams. The only one that's worse is Vanderbilt, and it's negli negligible, and Vanderbilt does not have the talent that Texas A&M has, and they do not have a $9 million a year head coach. On top of that, Bruce Feldman threw out this stat. It's unbelievable. Texas A&M has now scored 24 points or fewer. In other words, no more than 24 points in nine straight games against FBS opponents. So we're talking about the SEC, but we're also talking about App State. We're also talking about whatever. Nine straight games, they have not scored 24 points. And so everybody sits there and says, well, you know, he'll never give up play calling. Well, you look him in the eye and you say, you don't really have a choice. And I think you just be honest with him. And listen, I'm not claiming that I'm the AD and this is what I would do. But you just say to Jimbo Fisher, you say, if there was another guy calling plays right now, and that guy had the 108th offense in total, 108th ranked total offense in college football, is that a guy that you would keep on your staff? No. So Jimbo Fisher, the head coach, has to bring in a new offensive coordinator. He needs to fire Jimbo Fisher, the offensive coordinator. And I think then you can start to move forward with a ton of talent that will hopefully look better in a different system because this system ain't working, right? And I talked about it the other day is stop with the, you know, it just takes time for my quarterback to learn the system. What is good coaching? 
if you don't have the players, or you don't have the this or you don't have the that, you fit the system to your players. That's what the great coaches do. I know it's not a great day to talk about this, but Chip Kelly talks about that all the time. I don't have a system. I do what is best for the personnel that I have, and Texas A&M needs to do that. So that's what I think is going to happen over the next few weeks is, listen, Texas A&M, you look at the rest of their schedule, and let's be honest. I mean, you look at the schedule. They could pretty much win any game left on their schedule. They could pretty much lose any game left on their schedule. Currently three and four. They get Ole Miss at home on Saturday night in College Station, okay? And the truth is, the bottom line, we all know Ole Miss probably a little bit overrated after what we saw against LSU this week. But I think, you know, I think it'd be surprising if, if Texas A&M doesn't take care of Ole Miss. They get Florida at home. They get Auburn at home. Those, those should be wins. UMass, and then they close with LSU, who is obviously vastly improving. We just talked about that. So that's, that's just where we are. I'm not going to try to sit here and say silver lining, good, bad. That's just the reality. Offense isn't good. Three and four. Could have probably won the last two games. Have winnable games left on the schedule. Now it's up to, 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 to you know, it's up to see what happens next. The last part, though, and this is the part that I want to get to. This is the part that, to me, is slowly starting to change as the season goes on. There is, there is one opponent that Jimbo Fisher has to watch out for that is a much tougher opponent than Alabama, than LSU, than Georgia in the East, even though they don't play Georgia, than Tennessee in the East, and that they don't play Tennessee either. The opponent that Jimbo Fisher has to watch out for over the next six weeks. Two words. It's called, well, three words. The transfer portal. And to me, that is what is interesting right now And that is what is going to be interesting over these next six to eight weeks. Because look, part of what has given Jimbo Fisher a pass up until really probably about three or four weeks ago when things went sideways is you have this incredibly talented roster and you have this insane 2022 recruiting class. And so I think, you know, if Jimbo's sitting at four and three right now, five and two, bad loss here, but whatever, you can still sell. Well, you know, we got a lot of talent. What concerns me now, if I'm a Texas A&M fan, is at the end of the day, the biggest fear I have is not LSU, not Bama, as I just said. It is the transfer portal. Because, look, in in this era in college football, you're going to lose players. Like, you're just going to. I think even Alabama, since the the end of last season, has lost 20-plus players to the portal, okay? It's going to happen. The problem is, at most places, you're losing those second, third-tier guys, and it certainly hurts your depth. It certainly hurts um, what what happens when there's injuries. At Texas A&M, though, they a lot of these freshmen are playing, right? Leading receiver, Evan Stewart's playing. Uh, uh, offensive line, Cam Dewberry, true freshman, is playing. On the defense, Shamar Stewart, Walter Nolan. These are all guys that were five stars in last year's class. Denver Harris at corner. They're all playing. And so the fear now becomes, what if those guys leave? Because one, they're really talented. Two, they're actually getting minutes and reps and snaps on the field. And that would be my biggest concern. I think that's the biggest thing to be concerned about because you got a star wide receiver named Evan Stewart. That could be a first round pick, but if he doesn't feel like he could be a first round pick at A&M, if he doesn't feel like the system is built for him or the quarterbacks are good enough or the play calling is good enough, it ain't 2018 anymore. He can leave. He can leave after the season. And by the way, I'm not saying he's going to, I'm not saying any of these players are going to, but they can. And that's across the board. That's on the defensive front. That's on the offensive line. There's a five-star tight end named Donovan Green who's playing really well. And I'm not saying any of these players will leave. What I am saying, though, is that the option is there. There are obviously, we know how this stuff works. There are other schools probably talking to people very close to them, parents, seven-on-seven coaches, whatever, high school coaches saying, hey, listen, I'm not telling you to to, to leave A&M. But if he does leave, we've got a spot for him. And so to me, that's really what this, the rest of this season is about for Texas A&M for Texas A&M at this point, look, the season's over. You're not, yeah. Like I said, I think nine and three, really eight and four in a worst case scenario was kind of the goal, but really just build, get these young guys ready for 2023 and really make your run then. But I don't think, I don't think they're finishing eight and four, not with LSU still on the schedule, not with Ole Miss still on the schedule. But listen, I'd say a couple of things. One, Get, be good enough to get to a bowl game just so you get the extra practices. But two, right now, here's what the reality is. Figure out a way to be good enough to win enough games to just get some momentum so that you don't lose this entire roster. I think that's really what the next few months are about. Next few weeks are about is we're only, we only got five weeks left in the regular season. Do enough 
to keep these guys in the program, win enough, develop enough, evolve enough, improve enough to keep these guys in the season. Because I think Jimbo Fisher can survive a six and six year. I think he can survive a seven and five year. What I don't know that he will survive. And when I say survive, I don't mean actual job. I mean, public relations, PR. What I don't think he can survive is a season so bad where you go six and six, you go five and seven. But then on top of that, you lose a bunch of players to the transfer portal. 